Welcome back to the Homesteading for Beginners podcast. We are continuing uh, the conversation with Jasmine Bass about raising quail uh, for small scale homesteading. Quail are a, an excellent uh, livestock to start with, no matter what the size property you have. So I really wanted to get this information to you. And Jasmine has some very useful information. So I hope you take a listen to the second part. Don't forget to listen to part one, which is episode 38. This is episode 39. If you're new to my podcast, I have a lot of great things coming up. Normally, I just do one episode a week, but I will be going to two episodes a week starting next week. And I have some really good interviews coming up as well as solo episodes. So be sure to subscribe or follow however your listening app requires and come back and listen to the next episodes. This is the Homesteading for Beginners podcast, and I'm Mona Weathers, your homesteading mentor and coach. I'm here to encourage you to pursue your homesteading goals with the right mindset in a way that is healthy for you, your family, and your community. If you desire to establish a solid foundation for your homesteading journey, then you are in the right place. Join me as I share stories from the past 20 years of my own journey, as well as practical and actionable steps you can take to start and maintain a healthy homestead. Let's get into housing. Um, Mm -hmm. I know there's usually people either do the hutches or Mm -hmm. they do the aviaries, Mm -hmm. right? So what is the, why would you choose one or the other? Just yeah Um, space reasons so it's reasons would be um space so Mm -hmm. space you have the aviary has to be on the ground um and you want to have a a large enough space where they can um, fly so they have to be at least six foot tall and they need to be long enough that they can glide down so quail will pop up and flush when they're spooked or they're just rowdy and Mm -hmm. if they're given enough space they can jump up high and then glide down. And that's where the aviaries are fun for people who want to have a more natural setting or are used to having chickens free ranging. It kind of gives you that satisfaction that you've got birds on the ground, they can scratch, they can hide, and you can create that more natural setting. Um, It is not the most um, convenient setting because you'll have to look for the eggs like an Easter egg hunt every single day because Mm. they'll hide them all over the place. And uh, you'll have a lot more maintenance as far as, um, you know, dealing with the poop, you'll have to stir it in and have deep litter. So there's a lot of things to consider when you go to an aviary. Now, I love mine, um, but there's a little bit more effort on a daily maintenance that has to be done. And when you do hutches that you can do hutches or stacked cages. So a hutch, the difference between a hutch and a cage is that you have one side that's solid and completely covered. So kind of like a little cabin with a front porch like screened in front porch is what i think of them as and um those are the best for outdoor settings so if you don't have a barn and you just need to have animals outside in your backyard um without being in a building a hutch Mm -hmm. is going to be perfect because it gives them protection from elements but it also gives them fresh air and sunshine on the other side hutches are usually only like 12 inches tall which is important because those birds won't flush and hurt themselves in something Mm. that has a short ceiling. So uh, you don't want to use like a really large or tall rabbit hutch for quail, because if it's two foot tall, they can flush up and either break their wings or necks. So Mm. you want to modify something with a very low ceiling for hutches. And that goes the same with cages. So cages are great. Um, for people who have a barn or a shed, or maybe they just want them on their like screened in porch. Um, they typically have larger wire holes around the edge, which makes them less predator proof. Um, mm-hmm. And but they do have a fun feature of uh, a slight slant on the floor where the eggs roll out. So the maintenance oh. of that is really easy because you don't have to fuss with the birds. You can have right. everything automated. And it's just like, here comes the eggs every day. Yeah. And it, it's pretty self maintaining. So there's, there's several ways that you can um, keep quail. I've even seen people do tractors where they mm. move them every day. And of course there's always 
different things to consider, but the most popular styles are either going to be the cages, the hutches, or the aviaries. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When you, um, you shared with me before the, the, that it needs to be a certain, not too tall if you have a yeah. cage or a hutch. <laughs> I just hadn't even thought of that, but that makes mm -hmm. complete sense that, you know, they like to fly and they can yes. themselves. Yes. Yes. Um, so I want to ask about this feed because mm -hmm. I recently read, I was in one of those uh, uh, quail groups and I saw somebody uh -huh. mention something about their quail eat more than their chickens. Is that <laughs> something that you found to be true? So I have not found that to be true, but I will say that if you don't have the right style of feeders, they are wasteful. Mm. So uh, quail tend to like to stick their beaks in the feed and just rumble around until they decide mm. on the perfect piece of food. So mm. uh, a couple of ways you can reduce waste with quail is having um, a low waste feeder. So I take those plastic shoe boxes that you can get from like the you know, Rubbermaid shoe boxes for your, mm -hmm. for your shoes. And I will drill holes in them that are about an inch and a quarter wide. So they actually have to put their heads all the way in and any of that mm. fussing and mussing that they do in there right. stays inside the lidded container. Um, okay. If you use a normal chicken feeder, and I have some in my aviary, they just, I swear, they make it spin and just fling everywhere. So mm. That is where you'll see a lot more of that cost go to waste because they can be a little bit wild. So I'm um, mm -hmm. just taking a little bit of time to do that. The other option is fermenting their feed because mm -hmm. anytime you ferment food for any animals, uh, even my goats included, that is a lot more attractive to them. And because it's a little bit more moist, it sticks together. You don't have the dust and the crumbles flying out everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but I have found that cost wise, my birds maybe eat two cents a day. Mm. Okay. And so okay. In, in feed costs, whereas mm -hmm. my chickens were eating about five to 10 cents a day in feed costs. So okay. the older they are. And how, how okay. right. I was just going to say how many uh, quail do you have versus chickens? Like how does. Am I allowed to say that? On, in public record, no, <laughs> I have too many. Um, I usually maintain about um, 100 to 150 quail at a time. Okay. Um, and then sometimes I have more than that because I am putting them out for rotation for meat production. Um, okay. But because I have customers that are needing either chicks or eggs, it's easiest for me to keep a higher number. Um, mm. And sense. I also, something that people don't realize is when quail are chicks, they can, they can, they need to have a higher protein feed. So a game bird feed mm -hmm. or turkey starter, those are what they need to start off with for their first six weeks of life. That mm -hmm. feed is typically a lot more expensive than like a chicken layer feed. But once mm -hmm. they have reached adult size, they actually can be transitioned to the less expensive feed because they're no longer needing that high protein to meet up with their mm -hmm. demands of how fast they're growing. So mm -hmm. I switch mine to a less expensive layer feed. And that also makes a big difference in the cost going into maintaining these birds. So some people like right. to leave them on a game bird um, adult feed, but I don't feel, feel that it's necessary because there is no muscle growth or feather growth after eight weeks, 10 weeks old. So that's okay. a cost thing to think about. Um, and in our Quail University, uh, Quail 101, we actually have uh, downloadable calculators to figure out how many mm -hmm. birds you have, how um, much your feed cost is, how much they'll eat. And they'll give you a full rundown with just two little inputs of nice. how much you're going to expect to spend on these little birds. <laughs> oh, nice. That is, yeah, that is so awesome. Great. That's I love tools like that. Oh, they, <laughs> um, for just that alone, it saves so much uh, questions. Yeah. Right. Before we move on from feed, I um, I want to ask about uh, supplemental things sure. like like even scraps. Like you mm -hmm. know how we feed chickens or scraps. Is there are there things like that you can do as well? 
So they're, they are not as good of scroungers as chickens mm -hmm. are, but they do enjoy um, any of your vegetable or leafy green scraps. They love those. Um, something that I found that they don't do well with is any of your grain scraps and any of your uh, like meat scraps that you could give to chickens. Just mm -hmm. don't do much with those. Um, and I actually love to, um, it might be gross to some people if you're not used to this, but I will allow black soldier fly larva to mm -hmm. have a specific part of our compost. And those larva, as they come out, uh, go straight to the quail and they are really high protein, but they're also 30% calcium that's actually mm. usable for them. So it's great to add to your quail layers. It's basically like free food. It's not mm -hmm. for the squeamish. I can barely do it myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but then like something like sweet potato slips, I will grow sweet potato slips all summer long mm -hmm. and just cut them off and give them to the mm -hmm. quail as well. So any of your leafy greens and weeds and things like that, they absolutely love those. Uh, you just okay. want to stay away from the same things that you wouldn't give your chickens as far as plants go, like mm -hmm. the greens from tomatoes and potatoes. You don't want to give them those greens, mm -hmm. um, but Oh, they, they'll tear up any weeds that you give them or any plants okay. that you plant in there. They will destroy them. They love it. <laughs> okay. Yep. So that's good. Definitely supplement. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, I wonder if they would eat the kudzu. The chickens like kudzu. Oh, they will. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's go. We, we talked about a lot of the pros of having yes. them. Let's talk about the cons. I, I need to, uh, I think I've asked you this question before, but in case anybody has the same scenario, <laughs> same question. When I had a uh, checker, so, you know, I had checker at one point and I, yes. I was going to breed those for meat as well, meat and eggs. Yeah. And um, birds. <laughs> yeah, they're beautiful birds, but they're vicious to each yeah. other. Do you have any of that happening? So I had, I would raise um, them from eggs and mm -hmm. they would be raised together. And the males, I believe there were the males that were killing other males. Okay. Um, so I ended up with one male and three females is what ha ended up happening. I had no other males. So yeah. I, I'm assuming the oldest male or the most, the strongest one was just killing off the other ones. Yeah. Does that happen in quail as well? So quail are a lot less territorial than chucker. Okay. <laughs> Um, and a lot of the behavior issues with quail, if you, if you run into them have to do with a handful of things. So generally speaking, you can raise quail in a colony setting, which means you can have multiple sets of breeders. So the ratio that's ideal for eliminating that type of aggression is five hens to one rooster. And you can multiply that as long as you keep the ratios the same. So um, you know, if you had 25 hens, you could add five roosters to that. You have 30 birds. And um, there's also a square footage thing that needs to be considered with Caternix. So you don't want to have um, too much space because I have found when you give them too much space, they will become super territorial and you will have some of that behavior that you found with the chucker. So it might feel like they're a little bit uh, confined, but three birds per square foot of space is ideal because they um, work together as a, a full family instead of saying, this is my space, you can't be here. Any more crowded is way too crowded and you won't have good ventilation. You'll have health issues. Um, too few, you will absolutely have a territory issue. Now in the aviary, I actually give them an immense amount of space. So they'll have a whole two foot to themselves per bird, two square feet per bird. And again, in a colony setting, I really don't see any of those behavior issues. Um, sometimes the males will uh, be very tenacious breeders. And I try to pick ones that are the calmest. So if you have a male that tends to chase his hens, or mount them aggressively or pull any of their feathers off the back of their heads. I like to replace them with one that's a little calmer. Um, but overall, the aggression that you may see is very limited to um, inadequate space, inadequate uh, ratio of males to females, or not leaving food down 24-7. They do get a scarcity um, possession aggression 
So they need to have food available 24 seven to eliminate that aggressive behavior, trying to hoard food. So uh, do you have any other cons then? I mean, I don't know if that, if you consider that a con. Uh, well, I not. do. If for somebody that's brand new, um, mm-hmm. it can be very overwhelming if you don't have that information. So I think it's something that can, it can be a con for a newbie if they don't, if they're not aware of the ratios and the spacing and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. They are not as noisy as chickens, which makes them great for um, being in a backyard setting, in a neighborhood setting. However, the roosters, they sound beautiful. I love them. If during the peak of fertility production, which is going to be like your summer hours, we have the longest daylight hours. They love to sing all day, all night. So if you Mm -hmm. are very sensitive to this, it almost sounds like they say like wee wee or Cobra Kai or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's like wild town, blah, 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 blah. like they just look ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, the males will call out at all hours of the day and night. And so you just have to be very sensitive to that if you have neighbors that are a little bit sensitive to that. Um, I don't find it annoying at all. It's 10 times quieter than chickens. The hens make a sound that sounds a little bit like spring peeper frogs. It's just like a chirp or a cricket sound. So very soft and beautiful sound. Um, So if you don't need them for meat production, um, I would say go without the roosters. (laughs) If you're just needing egg production and then find somebody that can raise new ones for you when you need them. Um, A con that I would say is one of the bigger ones for me anyway is the amount of poop that they produce. So in an aviary setting, it's not so bad. In a cage setting, you have to be willing to change those trays out every few days um, or allow the poop to fall through the grates to the ground and be compost. Um, In an indoor setting, that smell can be a little bit overwhelming um, or even in a barn setting. So it's, A workaround is that you can line it, you can throw it away, you can put uh, wood shavings in a tray, like a poop tray, catchment tray, and uh, the shavings will absorb the moisture, which that's where that odor comes from in the first place. And then those trays can just be dumped into a compost. But I know that's kind of a luxury, having a space to just pile up compost. So some people won't have that luxury. So just kind of something to think about. It's not a true con, but if you are not somebody that likes to handle uh, waste regularly, um, you may reconsider these poop machines because they they produce a lot of it. Um, yes. Oh, man. So I think really my con list for quail is so, so small mm-hmm. uh, compared to the benefits of having them. Um I really can't think of a whole bunch of negatives for them to be completely honest. Uh, the chicks, if you're raising chicks, there's a little bit of a learning curve because they are so tiny. They're really mm-hmm. hardy. Um, they grow so fast. And I'm, mm-hmm. I really can't think of a whole lot of cons, Mona. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I'm glad that's, that's good to hear. And if anybody is considering it, mm-hmm. having a small cons list is good. So yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, so you mentioned your course and mm-hmm. I want you to talk a little bit about that because I know people are going to want to find out more about that. Yeah. So, um, I partnered with two of my wonderful friends who are also quail keepers and this came about because there aren't very many good books or like online resources for raising quail for beginners. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, very complicated, complex, topics about them, but not just the basics. And there's, of course, lots of YouTube videos and there's all these things. So what we wanted to do is pull together two different styles of keeping quail and breaking it down to everything a newbie would need to know. Um, There are 10 chapters. There's like almost eight video hours of all the way, like you don't have to know anything. We start from like the history of what, where they came from, all the pros and cons lists. We talk about raising chicks, raising adults, um, how much it costs to feed them, how to incubate them, troubleshooting, raising them, um, housing options, 
all the things. I even have a video on how to butcher them for those that have never butchered a uh, quail before. So we've got everything there for you. And then you have the community to back it up. Um, so it's, it's quailuniversity.com. And our first course there is Quail 101. And uh, we're just, we're really, really excited about how well it turned out. It was like blood, sweat, and tears, <laughs> learning technology to make this work for the communities. And it's, it's something that once you've gotten the course, you can have it forever. And uh, there's no like subscriptions or anything. It's, it's very inexpensive. We wanted to put it in the hands of everybody that would like to have it. So $49 for what? all of that information. I know. <laughs> that is really cheap. <laughs> I know. But the other thing we wanted to do is make sure that we were pouring back into our communities. So yeah. um, some of the proceeds go to um, uh, an event called Quail Con, where it's hmm. all of this teaching. It's just teaching and fellowship community. And that happens in Ohio at My Shire Farm. And then we also have a program um, with our farm partner, my share farm for like basically a scholarship for kids that are 18 and under. So we really mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that we provided ways for kids to get uh, connected with doing something like raising their own meat and eggs, mm -hmm. um, have that responsibility. So we have all these wonderful partners that help us with that. But a lot of the proceeds that we have set aside for donating goes to that. So okay. it's, it's a big project of love because yeah. I really don't think that enough people realize that they could still do homesteading in a small mm -hmm. scale with any kind of animal. So just getting that out there and teaching them how to be successful and reach their goals. That was our, that was our, our thoughts behind it. So, yeah, well, that's beautiful. I love that. I love yeah. how this community serving the community yeah. and, and that's, that's wonderful. Uh, well, I, I'm sure we have convinced a few people, at least <laughs> listening to this, that they should get quail or at least start, at least take the course yes. to learn more about it. And I'm I'm still, I'm very close. I'm actually working on looking at some designs for a hutch. Awesome. Um, so if you have any resources for that too. <laughs> I honestly, I'm going to tell you, I my favorite hutch that I have found, and I actually got to see it in person, is from my friend Chris Carnes from Slightly Rednecked on YouTube. So okay. his design is very simple and it's very doable it has it's an actual hutch and i love the one feature that i love the most is that the the solid side is a literal sandbox so oh. the mess is so easy to get through because you can mm -hmm. take a kitty litter scoop and get out any of the waste so you don't have wasted sand and soiled nice. sand but the the hens love to lay their eggs in there so you always have clean, beautiful eggs instead mm. of like possibly poopy eggs and things yeah. like that. And, you know, I know where you're at in Georgia, it doesn't get nearly as cold as some of the other states do, but you, the hutch style allows even birds in sub-zero temperatures to live well. And when it's really, really mm -hmm. hot temperatures, they have good ventilation. So that's my favorite hutch style. If you look up okay. uh, slightly rednecked on YouTube, He's got okay. a whole playlist. Chris Carnes is a great guy. I absolutely love him. Okay, that sounds good. Um, well, I'll look that up. Um, yeah. So I think, I think we kind of covered a good amount today. Absolutely. And where can people find you, like on social media and stuff? Where can they yeah. find you? Uh, so you can find me on YouTube. I'm brand new at it. I don't have very many videos there, but it's coming soon. And that's Time and Timber Homestead, which is like the herb. T H Y M E, <laughs> as well as the same on Instagram, Time and Timber. Now, I do, if you're just specifically looking to learn about quail, I have a Facebook group called The Self Sufficient Quail. And that is specifically for people who are wanting to homestead and use raising quail as part of their self sufficiency journey. And I have an incredible community there, of super helpful people that uh, are excited to see you succeed raising quail. So if you are specifically looking for that, that would be the place to go. Yeah, that group grew really fast. I remember oh seeing it like <laughs> when you first started it. And I was like, wow, how many yeah. people are in, the, in there now? Uh, we've got about 6,000 members. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. it grew really fast. That's awesome. Okay, well, thank you for coming and explaining the quail. And I'm really excited about getting mine. Um, 
So I, I'll be sure to tell you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will be excited for you. I know you've been thinking about it for a while and Honestly, it's kind of addicting. So just be careful. Uh, we've got a couple people in our little circle quite addicted to hatching and raising quail. They are fun. Mm -hmm. And yeah. thank you so much for inviting me to talk about it. This yeah, is thank you. Real excited about. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we'll see you later. Thank you for listening to this series. If you have any questions for Jasmine or you want to get connected with her, I have the links in the show notes. So just go check that out. I also have some things happening myself. The workshop for beginner homesteaders and dreamers starts next week. It is a uh, replay available and there will be a, um, an option to buy the workshop as well afterwards, but it will be more than if you purchase it before May 3rd. So if you purchase before May 3rd, the price is listed in on the website. So just check that out. And just remember that um, it will be there if you ever need it and you want to know how to get started with homesteading in a way that is healthy for you and your family and your community and not stressing you out all the time and making you go broke. So there is that. Um, so just check that out. And thank you again for listening.